Now you mentioned uh, the, the family home or the matrimonial home. So of course, um, uh, in a co cohabitation case, we would just call it a family home. But uh, in the there's in no a, matrimony. <laughs> yeah, there's no matrimony. All right. So let's start again with uh, the legally married uh, situation. Uh, how is the matrimonial home treated um, upon separation? Um, because I, I know that okay. So there's property. It's almost like property in general. But I know that matrimonial homes are special. So can you maybe uh, explain, give us a, a quick overview as to what is so special <laughs> about the matrimonial home? Okay, um, probably the best place to start is with the general statement that's set out in the Family Law Act, that if you are married and your marriage breaks down and you separate, each party is entitled to an equalization of net family properties. So that's, that's the key phrase. It's an equalization of net family properties. Right. When you are talking about the matrimonial home as a piece of property, it's not treated the same as other property, because still when you're doing an equalization of net family property, if I have a bank account or investments or anything that are all in one name, I get to claim, like I have to put down the total value of those. I get to include the value of all the debts that I have. And if it's a debt that's in my name alone or property that's in my name alone, it goes only on my side of the ledger when you're figuring out the equalization of that family properties. If a property is owned jointly, except for the matrimonial home, then I would claim half because I own half of it. And the person that I own it jointly with would then claim the other half of it. If it's my spouse, half the value of a jointly owned asset, like a bank account, I claim, right. and the party claims the other half. A matrimonial home, if and that's it only applies when you're married. So it's not a family home, it's a matrimonial home. Okay. Matrimonial home is always equalized, no matter whose name it's in. So even if the home that the family lives in is 100% in my name and me and my spouse separate, when we're figuring out the equalization of net family properties, even though I own that property, it's 100% in my name, I, can, I have to claim half the value of that house, but the other spouse is entitled to half the value of that house as well. But it's, it's what the value is. It doesn't mean that all of a sudden they own half the house. It just means when you're doing figuring out who has to pay somebody to you know, when this thing breaks down, then that's what you look at. So that's a matrimonial home is treated different from other property because when you're doing your net family property calculations, then even if the house is only owned by one of the parties, each of the parties claims half the value of the house. Right. If the only asset the couple has when they're, they've decided the relationship is over and they separate is right. a house, right. and the house is worth $400,000 and there's a $200,000 mortgage, Right. That means the equity in the house is $200,000. Even if that house is only in the name of one of those spouses, the net equity in that property is $200,000. That person gets to keep the house, maybe, because what they've got to do is come up with $100,000 to pay out the other spouse for their interest in the matrimonial home. Now, quite often what will happen is that the spouse that actually owns the house might have to sell it because otherwise, how are they going to come up with the money to pay off 100000 to the other side? But they don't have to. It just means that they owe an equalization payment to the other side of that $100,000. And oh. if that's not the only asset that they, that that person, like that either party owns, then that $200,000 total equity gets attributed half to husband, half to spouse. And then it, it's only part of the, like, then you keep adding things and subtracting them on each side until you get the number that drops at the bottom. So actually, you're not forced to sell the matrimonial home when you divorce, right? I mean, you're not, for, I, I, I thought that if, um, if a couple divorces, they have to sell the home. That's not true, right? <laughs> if the house is registered in both parties' names. Yes then either party can apply to the court for an order that the property be sold if the other party refuses to sell the home. Oh, okay. But if the house is only owned by one party, um, then, as I said, basically, and again, you still should be seeking legal advice on this because it's not going to happen 100% of the time, but the general rule is, is that you can't be made to sell the house just because you've separated if you've been married and the house is in your name. What you are going to have to do is pay the other side an equalization payment. Okay. And if you cannot do that any other way, then by having the house sold, there might 
be the ability on the other side after getting legal advice and seeing if it's appropriate in their situation to force the sale of the matrimonial home because it's the only way to satisfy the equalization payment. But again, oh, if, right. but that again, if you've got a situation where you're a married couple who separates and one person has a matrimonial home and the other person has GICs and right. the equity in the matrimonial home is $100,000, the other spouse, the equity of their, in the value of their GICs is $100,000, it's a wash. So the spouse A doesn't owe an equalization payment to spouse B. And if they own the house, they, they're entitled to hang on to it. The other person's not entitled to any interest in the house and can't force the sale because they've got $100,000 in GICs that they're not being forced to sell either. So there you go. Do you want to talk about uh, the right to possession? Um, because I think you mentioned that um, in a in a cohabitation uh, relationship relationship, there's no right to exclusive possession. Yes. Can you elaborate? Yeah. Can you? Yeah. Can you? Okay, this on is that? this is another one of those big myths that are out there it's saying it doesn't matter if you're married or living together, if you you're both in the home and one of you and you that you separate, that you're both entitled to stay in the home, regardless of whose name the home is in, like who owns that home. Yeah. And it's again, one of those things that is not true um, because exclusive possession is an aspect of property and the rules in the Family Law Act only apply to married couples. So if you are in a common law relationship and if you are living with your partner in a home that's owned by 100% by the other partner, you don't, and then you separate you do not have any grounds or right under the law to say that you want exclusive possession of the family home. Again, it's not a matrimonial home because you're not married. If you're in a common law relationship uh, and the home is registered in the name of the other party, there is no right to exclusive possession of the family home in a common law situation. Um, again, it's the same thing. You're in a common law relationship, the relationship is broken down, it's like your platonic roommates. If the relationship breaks down, then the one that owns the house gets to stay in it and the other one has to leave. Um, yes, um, sometimes there will be things that happen because of the intersection between criminal law and family law. Yeah. And so there, ha and again, part of the problem is, is because a lot of police officers don't understand the difference between what your rights are in a marital situation as opposed to a common law situation. Right. And if let's say that um, a relationship is deteriorating, and your spouse is violent, and the final triggering event for the separation is that your spouse either actually physically assaults you or threatens you or does something to make you fear for your own life or safety. Yeah. And you're living in a home that is owned by your common law spouse. There are situations where the police, if you report it and your spouse gets charged, part of the spouse's release conditions in the criminal court proceedings might not um, allow for the, the the accused to come back or attend at or near the family home because it's and but it's part of the criminal law release form right. and again technically and actually what a, a lot of lawyers that do family law would then come back and argue is saying well police officers didn't understand it it might make sense to say there's got to be maybe a, a limited period of time where you allow the spouse that was assaulted or threatened time to get her stuff packed up and out of the house and be gone. But there really shouldn't be an order and there could not be an order under family law rules that would say, give a, a person in a common law situation the right to stay in a home where they're not on title. Wow. But there could be other intervening factors like conditions on a bail release if there's been an assault charge or a threatening charge laid or whatever on the accused. Um, the other side thing that can come in sometimes is there's a backdoor way of maybe of doing it is that if you are in a common law relationship, living in a home owned by your partner, but there's a child born of that relationship. And if you are claiming um, spousal support or child support, you might be able to claim that as part of your child support claim is that you be able to stay in the home because it's the child's home mm, but it's, right. it's, as part of a claim for the child support. If there are no children, you don't even have that option.